Alrighty. Ah, welcome back to Her Tell. Okay, we do these periodically. We take a minute. We talk mental health because if you lose your mind, what's the old uh, Kipling thing? Keeping your head while those around you lose it. We're going to try really hard not to do that because we're going to talk to Dr. Katie Gordon, who has once again returned to Her Tell to try to help us navigate the anxious times we all live in. Dr. Katie, how are you, ma'am? Great to see you again. Great to see you too. Thanks so much for having me back and for prioritizing mental health on your show. Yeah, we we try to do it every so often. We always do it with you. Look, it's an election year. Everything designed about an election year, because I think this is my ninth or 10th most important election of my lifetime. I lose track after, I think somewhere around the Clinton administration, I started just like, okay, I, I don't really believe this, but that's how it gets hyped up to us. It's important, but we're going to hear this over and over and over again. We know there's things like winter blues, right? People get sad in the wintertime. We know there's there's seasonal stuff. Is there such a thing as political election year anxiety? Is that a diagnosable condition? Because it sure seems like people suffer from it. It's not technically in the diagnostic manual, but I think it is a real phenomenon that you are talking about. I mean, I think that we've certainly seen this in recent elections that it, it's, it can be tense and stressful for a lot of people who are engaged in kind of keeping posted on all of the latest news. Yeah, and the thing about news, we've talked to you before about this, but you're really good at explaining this. I think it's just yelling at your clouds to say social media is bad for your mental health. Social media is just a fact of life now. It just is. I've watched my own kids grow up almost completely in the social media age. No, it's not all bad. Yes, there's some legitimate concerns. Give me a ratio breakdown of that, though, because I think we just scream the buzzwords and miss out on it. We've talked about it at length before that, you know, there's, social media is like anything else. It's a tool. There's good and bad. Give me a ratio, though, of what you're hearing and seeing, you know, both with your colleagues, because I know I know the community that you're in of the experts and you are an expert. They're talking about this on end, though. But Give me a ratio of it. What is it good to bad, do you think? Because people are just beating this thing to death as a buzzword, but it's just reality for an entire generation now. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I, I think there are, it's a polarizing issue and there are a lot of people and research to be fair that can highlight some of the potential mental health harm that social media can do. And then there is also some research suggesting that it can cause benefits related to mental health. And so what I, my my thing is, is I think there is so much individual variability and individual difference. And I think it's really important for us as parents or caregivers, supporters to keep an eye on our children and see how their mood is being impacted and just kind of see how they're being impacted by it. Because, you know, we can see on one hand, if they don't have any social media, they could feel excluded or left out. Um, on the other hand, if they're on it too much, they're making comparisons to other people. They can also feel left out or bad about themselves. So really, I think that we have to kind of look at our own feelings, the consequences and effect of social media, and try to set boundaries for ourselves. And then as parents try to set boundaries for kids. And so I, I, it's kind of not a hard and fast rule for every person. Dr. Katie Gordon joining us. I want to go the other direction though, because we're always beating up on the kids because that's easy. And because that's, that's the monetizable group, right? Concerned right. parents, they spend right. a lot of money on their concern, right? We'll talk about that some other time. I want to go the other way because we've got all this data now. I was just doing a program on this where the median age of news network viewers for CNN, MSNBC, and Fox is like 70, 69, and 71. Well, There is a thing going on. I talk to, this isn't scientific study. I, this is all, you know, anecdotal, but it's, it's too much to ignore. This thing with the older generation getting more and more into a TV hole as they age, I've seen it with my own parents. Look, my, my dad had a stroke on New Year's Day, so I was in their home constantly for about two months. I basically moved back in with him while he got back on his feet. He's doing very well now. Okay. But I see in their peer group, you know, that over 70, dad 77, mom 76. I hear from so many people my age in our mid 40s, our parents like, man, all they do is watch news all day. We don't talk about that demographic, but there's all these data set. I am obsessed over 
things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson because it runs in my family and I've already got a brain injury. We got all the data in the world that the worst thing you can do for an elderly person is let them watch TV all day. It's not good for them. How come we don't talk about that? Because that's definitely a thing that's going on now. We're talking about social media. The older generation is not exactly adapting great. We should talk about that part of mental health too, shouldn't we? Oh, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, as, as the lifespan, the average lifespan continues to get longer or um, stay longer than it was decades ago, I think we really need to think about, like you said, those of us who are kind of middle-aged, some of us are caregivers already um, and care about our parents and thinking about them, but also for our own lives as we age. And so you're right. I think that there is a lot of focus tends to be on youth and younger people, and that's probably been true for a long period of time. But we know that older people can be at higher risk for suicide and loneliness and other types of physical and mental health issues that may be negatively, um, I would say, kind of exacerbated by watching, consuming TV versus doing other things, connecting with people. And we also know that um, news, TV news networks can also be polarizing and cause problems for people, um, conflicts that might further break up relationships or alienate people. Yeah, Dr. Katie Gordon joining us. Let's start there because suicide is the extreme end of the spectrum. That's the worst case scenario in a lot of ways. That, that means there's been, you know, multiple failures of not only the system, but the people around them. Sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes somebody just goes off and does something you don't can't do anything about. Suicide is whatever spectrum you want in mental health. That's that's the bad part. That's the top, the side, however you want to describe it. You've you've literally wrote the book about this. We've seen really conflicting numbers when it comes to suicide in the modern age. And, and part of it is, look, the really good studies, we've only had social media now since, like, really it was social media combined with the smartphone. That's, that's the combination, right? So let's say 06, 07 when the iPhone started. So really we've only had about 15, 20 years of this, less than 20 years of this. We don't even have good data sets really, right? We're trying to learn this on the fly all this conflicting information when it comes to su suicide stats, what's the one or two pieces of information people should know about suicide when it comes to our modern age of social media, modern media? Just give us one or two good pieces of information that we know, because there's a lot of conflicting information about that. You're right. And you make a really good point. One is, is not having decades worth of data, but another piece of it is that suicide is complex and there are so many individual pathways to get there. I know I really emphasize these individual differences, but important things to know in terms of how social media can impact suicide or suicidal thoughts. I, I really think that we know from decades of, of research too, that a robust protective factor against suicide is feeling connected to people. And so sometimes social media really enhances that. You know, for example, I was just messaging with some friends back in North Dakota, which I moved away from North Dakota into Massachusetts, and it helps enhance us keep in touch. Next time I go back, it, it helps us to plan visits. All of that stuff is probably easier than it would be without social media. However, the other side of it is that sometimes if people are getting all their social needs met on social media, and not following that up with some in-person in interactions or strengthening connections, then they can still be at risk for that loneliness piece. And that can be really tough. That's one thing that stands out. And then, okay, and then the other thing that I just want to mention, so it's kind of a balance of prioritizing, still having some in-person connections. And then the other piece of it is what are people doing on social media? So if you're doing something, for example, um, you know, that looking at a lot of people who are focused on weight loss or um, certain body types, and you're watching a lot of those on social media, 
and feeling bad and comparing yourself, uh, that can increase your risk for mental health problems. Um, it can increase maybe thoughts that you're not worthy person and it can just make you in a worse mood. And so I do think it's important. I encourage people to curate their social media needs and think, um, their social media feeds and really think about intentionally what they're exposed to and also consider putting constraints and boundaries on it if they notice that they're starting to feel worse or fixate on things that they've read. Yeah, we, Dr. Katie Gordon joined us. We talk about things like, you know, politics and stuff. And I'm going to get back to that. And we always talk culture and, um, you know, things in media as in new, you know, not just news media, but movies and TV shows with you and things like that. But that curation part really has a lot to do with this. We talk about things like adolescent girls, adult daughters. So I'm a little touchy that one. An area that you're an expert on, frankly, I know you probably don't like me saying that, but more than me, something like an eating disorder and social media, we do know that that has a toxic mix to it. Things like that. Just using that as an example, because you've wrote and lectured on it. Um, I think you even did some undergrad work on it in your thesis, if I remember right. Something like an eating disorder where all of a sudden food is in your feet. I'm guilty. I do Twitter supper club. I put a lot of food. To me, that's something that makes my life better, though. But I could see where somebody else that would be a problem. When you talk curation, use that example because that's a pretty quick, clean example that people can understand. Like, oh, eating disorder, seeing food nonstop, that can be problematic and how to actually affect change and be healthy with that sort of thing. Well, first of all, I'm amazed at all the stuff that you remember know about my background. So, <laughs> so I looked it up. My brain ain't that good. I got brain damage, too, but I look it up for you. I do try to prepare somewhat. No, it's it's really impressive. I so Twitter Supper Club is a perfect example of a positive social media experience because what people are doing is they're just sharing the meals and the joy surrounding them. The things that I get concerned about r related to eating disorders are people are talking about what I eat in a day and it's a very restricted not enough food or it's ruling out food groups like carbohydrates or something like that. And it's creating this image of um, food as something that is not something to be enjoyed or part of nourishment, but rather something that you do to change who you are. That's what I'm concerned about, as well as um, some, you know, there are products out there that influencers can, can go on TikTok or Instagram and talk about that talk about promoting weight loss and they can have hazardous effects on people. Um, we know from research that the vast majority of diets um, result can result in weight loss, but that they are not maintained and um, people can blame themselves for that. So I think if you're thinking about food as a celebratory and nourishment, that's a wonderful thing. If you're thinking about it as a way to change yourself because you're inadequate or in a way that perpetuates bias against fat people, then that is less healthy and has a negative impact. What's a healthy way of using social media to talk about this issues? Because it's real easy for us to sit around and go, okay, we'll talk, be open about this, be open about mental health or your particular, you know, if you have an addiction thing or you have an eating disorder or you have depression or you have anxiety, it's good to talk about. It. Okay. That's real easy for us to say, the truth is the social media environment is not that quick and clean and that's not that nice a place. And you can put the most nice, fuzzy Elmo can ask how your day is and it goes sideways. Right. Right. Corner, right? <laughs> remember that? Yes, I do. Um, I, I remember I I don't talk about it a lot, but I had my anniversary for sobriety showed up pretty recently. All all I did was show the freaking coin. And I got a couple nasty things in my DM about it. I'm like, what what kind of lack of lives do you people have? Seriously. Like, I just don't. We have to acknowledge that that's part of it, too. Right. Like when when we're talking to people, when you're talking to patients, you're counseling somebody. It, do we over buzzword of just saying, oh, just talk about your feelings, be open about it. That's easier said than done. Right. Yes, exactly. You're you're exactly right about that. Actually, TikTok had recently released um, a kind of guide for people who are sharing their stories of mental health stories and things to consider. And it includes both the impact to the, the person speaking and the content creator, and also thinking about the audience. And so some of the things that you have to be aware of is that I, stories, I think, can be 
encouraging when they're sharing that there were these struggles and you were able to overcome them and sharing that piece of it can make people feel less alone. And yet there are people out there, enough people watch videos or see a post that are gonna comment on it. And so I think as a content, from the content creator perspective, you wanna think about protecting and prioritizing your own recovery and mental health. In terms of an audience, I, you know, this is such a topic that I think a lot of people could have different opinions. My personal approach, and I admit that this is influenced by my experience as a therapist, is that specific details of mental health experiences, like for example, if someone's talking about a suicide attempt, they don't need to share the methods of it to have an impactful story. And in fact, that could potentially um, prompt negative responses in people or things like that. So if they talk about what their feelings are and what their emotions are, that can be very helpful. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying people shouldn't be able to say whatever they want. They can. I'm just saying that there are certain types of things I've noticed. So like in certain types of therapy, there might be guidelines that the therapist is considerate about in terms of if you're talking to someone who's had an eating disorder and you as a therapist has had an eating disorder, you might talk about some of the feelings you have, but maybe not go into the details of the specific behaviors you did that harmed your body because that might not be useful to them. Yeah, you just brought it up a couple times here in your peer group. When you go to go to conferences, when you're doing, you know, peer review stuff now, is there talk about content creators? Because I don't think we have any kind of a comparison to what content creators are doing now. I guess you could talk about maybe the old talk show host, but it's such a much smaller number than what, you know, Sarah, Jesse, Raphael and Donahue are nowhere near what we got. In, oh, even Oprah. Um, which I know was a was a bit of a mental health touch point for a long time. There was mm -hmm. controversy, like how much is she helping? How much is she hurting? The numbers are just staggeringly small compared to what content creators can do now. Is there talk amongst your peers, the experts, the therapists, the people that are trying to do good of like, we've got to rethink how we're doing everything because our competition now is not TV and it's not radio. It's not even the internet. It's these influencers that discussion has to be going on, right? Oh, absolutely. I think one of the big things that um, you've probably seen in one of the big discussions is people who are diagnosed, self-diagnosing based on TikTok. Um, and in some cases, I think it can be really helpful to hear content creators, like have people share their voices and their stories and have the audience recognize, oh, that might be what's going on with me. I'm going to go get evaluated. And in other cases, I think that there is this incentive for content creators to say things that get more views or that are relatable and to sustain that. And some of them have misinformation. They're just not, you know, they're not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're not screened for accuracy most of the time, right? And so I think it can go both ways where it's a true gift that people who didn't have voices before can reach others and that can help spread information. But the downside is it also can spread misinformation. So one thing that I do like that I've seen a trend more of in schools is having speakers and programs talk about critically thinking when you're looking at social media. I don't know how impactful those programs always are, but I'm glad that they're there and therapists are definitely talking about these things. So what do, okay, that's the therapist level. Mm -hmm. What should the audience level be looking at when they see content creators? Because there's more and more of them. I don't, the screaming ad ones are kind of easy to pick out because they they either go heavy on the bro culture and the guy's just right. screaming at you and that, that kind of advertising drives me nuts. Or you, you know, you get the lady with the front facing camera in her car. That stuff's kind of easier to pick out, right? Yeah. But give us some guidelines here because you are just inundated with content. And part of the thing with the content creators is if they're doing it right, 
you know, they're supposed to sound just like us. They're not supposed to sound like a doctor. They're not supposed to sound like a talking head on TV. That's both the blessing and the curse of the content creator. Give us a couple of things to try to discern through that. Well, one thing that this is just my rule of thumb is that when you're hearing a statement that the person is saying is indicative of some mental health problem, think, does that a statement apply to almost everyone? Because I've seen, I've had that happen a few times where someone will say, you know, well, I struggle with procrastination. So that means it must be from this larger mental health condition. And yes, there are people who have it at an extreme level, but most of us struggle with procrastination. So if it's kind of a generic statement, one test to do is think like, would 95% of people relate to this statement? And if so, then maybe it's not something that is um, indicative of a mental health problem. It's still something to work on, but what I get concerned about is that sometimes it's saying you definitely have blank disorder if you do this, right? So that's one piece of it. I think the other piece of it is that um, mental health advice and maintenance, at least this is my perspective, a lot of what's shown to be most helpful can feel kind of boring. Like it's not usually these really cool quick fixes that are tend to be spoken about in social media. So for example, it's not going to be as exciting if someone's talking about like a really strong way to help with depression for a lot of people is to get a little more physical activity or to do something fun or to hang out with people. Those are kind of bland, boring prescriptions. And yet we know those things make a big difference. You're more likely to hear something like, um, you know, dive into freezing cold water and keep your body under there for several minutes. So things like that, which I'm not recommending to be clear. So it, that's another thing. If it seems like some kind of quick fix out there thing, that's something to just be critical of. It doesn't mean it's always untrue. It just means to question it a little bit. Yeah. Dr. Katie Gordon joining us talking mental health. The parameters around what you're just talking about is, is the reason we have to talk about content creators. And look, the whole debate in all of this is about social connectivity. And a lot of psychiatry is based around how people function in social connectivity, right? Because that's, you know, that's the start and or the result of whatever your issue might be. And that's where the symptoms usually pop up. We have to discuss social connectivity, but do we need to just let go of our own definition? I've seen it in my own children, though, like, they, especially my youngest kid, they don't really see a difference between in-person relationships and online relationships. There, There's not a big gap to them like they are for the older generations that went from the one to the other. Like, you know, we, we had internet when I was in school, but you did it at the school lab. We didn't really have it at home. I'm kind of that last analog generation. So I see a big difference between those two things. They don't. The generation behind them is going to be even less so. The generation behind me sees a huge difference more than I do. Do we need to start breaking it down that way? Because I don't think we can just say, oh, we got to work on social connectivity because I say that an older person is going to think meeting at the coffee shop. I can probably go either way on it. My kids are thinking, well, I, I commented on their TikTok, so I'm good now. Right. Don't we need to kind of start breaking that down that way? Because none of those three things are unhealthy in and of themselves. But the one group may think the other two groups automatically unhealthy because they don't see it the same way. Do we need to kind of have that conversation a little different and change the nomenclature some? Yeah, I think that's a good point that we want to have a lot of flexibility. And I think one good check is to look at the person's mental health. Do they feel lonely? Do they feel like they belong? If they feel lonely, then let's look at what they're doing. Are they only talking to people on social media, not seeing anyone in person, well, then it might be worth trying. Well, how does it feel different when you see people in person? You know, those types of things I think can be really helpful. And I don't think we're always aware of that. So sometimes I think it's helpful to just track it, you know, rate your mood from one to 10 for a week on days that you, and then compare days that you see someone in person versus days that you're only connecting on social media or, you know, different levels of that. I think it's important to be curious and look at that because I know, like, for example, I might say, well, I'm an introvert and I, and I work from home virtually and I don't, I don't need to see people in person that much. And yet I can't deny that when I meet with people from work in an in-person meeting, it's different. Something is different about it. 
And so that's me. I don't, but I don't think I'm alone in that. So I guess what it, what's really important is to just, like you said, be flexible, look at the mental health, look at the feelings of connectedness and go from there. Yeah, Katie Gordon joining us. We always ask you this. I'm going to ask you like we always do. TV, movie, music, things that you've seen that have good representations of good mental health or at least deal with it in a positive way. What have you been watching and listening and viewing that you think are pretty good and have impressed you with how they've covered such things lately? It's a great question. I'm trying to think about the recent things I've seen and they're, they're mostly... Old. So I've been rewatching Frasier and then I went to. It's funny you mentioned that. I talked about being up at my mom and dad's. Mm -hmm. I was watching, I'm talking old stuff, black and white mm -hmm. uh, wagon train episodes. If, if that's a Western for you young kids, go Google it. <laughs> but they, there was these old Westerns and um, there was an episode of Gunsmoke where these guys that were uh, Civil War veterans and they didn't call it this, but it was a PTSD episode. Wow. It really was. Like when you think about it, because what it was, was they had kidnapped this guy that everybody thought was the upstanding member of the community. This is a black and white gun smoke. This is early. Like Burt Reynolds is on it. And nobody knows who he is. These are the early, the, the local guy in town turned out to be the guy that ran their prison camp and they were prisoners of war and they're torturing him slowly. Oh. And they literally made a cage and put him in a cage because they wanted him to experience what they experienced. It was a PTSD episode. They just didn't call it that. And, you know, Dylan's got to go out there. With, you know, he goes out there and he's talking to me and he's finally like, like, no, you can't do this. You have to let it go. You have to deal with this. Look at him. You're starving him to death. Look, you know, his wife, you know, I've been kind of surprised. There was an old Walton's one where a guy came back during war. They had the World War II episode and a guy came back from the Navy and he was different. And they were like, man, he's just different now. And he's like, I've been out on these ships. You don't understand. I was in the South Pacific or whatever. I've actually been kind of impressed going back reading that old stuff. So when you mentioned that, watching those old shows with my dad, old Heat of the Night stuff was really like that was SVU before SVU guys. Go go watch the old Heat of the Night stuff. Maybe I misremember it. Some of that old TV show did a lot better with it than I think I remember or that I think I gave it credit for at the time. Oh, you're so right. Actually, you're you're reminding me that I watched um I think it was, was the Bob Newhart show? It was Newhart, right? Where he's the therapist. Well, there was three of them to be fair of them. So yeah. it's hard to pick which <laughs> yes. one's which, right? Yes. And, and that one ending was linked to the other show. So it's all <laughs> the famous ending of that. So anyway, um, yeah. So Newhart was taking patients who had fear of flying on a plane. And I'm like, that is exactly the treatment. That is the best treatment is exposure when someone's afraid of it. So you're right. It's kind of seeing some of the older stuff can kind of surprise you. but then again, it, it makes sense. I mean, that's when PTSD was first being identified and people were observing these things even without social media. And so, of course, it came up in, in film and TV shows. I think the best example, of course, is the old MASH because they were using Korea to talk about Vietnam. And mm -hmm. some of the audience now probably doesn't realize that. It's like, no, it's about the Korean War and it's and it's obviously shot in California because you can tell it's California, especially on the helicopter shots. But they were actually talking about Vietnam. And when you watch MASH from the beginning to the end, because it got a lot more serious in the later years, some of that was Alan Alda became the creative, did a lot of the directing, and they steered it more serious. But if you watched a lot of that show, and we watched a lot of that in my household, especially reruns, I'm just old enough to remember the last episode and the hype of that and all that. I was really little. But you could see them almost working it out in real time of like, wait a minute, we're a comedy, but this is really heavy crap. Mm -hmm. And then it got heavier and heavier and heavier. And by the time, and I watched this episode of my mom and dad recently, by the time you have Ron Howard being the soldier that lied about his age and they got to send him home and, and then Hawkeye outs him and sends him home. And he gets really mad. He's like, I'm going to hate you all my life. And he goes, well, they, people forget the cultural significance. Like, no, that's not Ron Howard. That's Opie. 
Yes, yes. That's mm -hmm. Opie from Andy Griffith. Mm -hmm. And the reason I brought that up, because I know that's a huge generational gap, though, we're starting to see overlap in these content creators. We're seeing these child stars grow up and they're becoming adults live on people who have literally been on YouTube and social media all their lives now. They're moving into adulthood. I'm starting to see some of that. And it's not as abrupt as that because you don't have 30 million people watching the same show every night. Mm -hmm. But I think you're seeing the same kind of thing in real time of some of these content creators that started out as teen and young adults doing all the crazy zany stuff. And now you see them switching. And I don't know that people understand. It's like, no, every generation goes through this. The TV generation did it differently. They're going to do it differently. But this is a natural process. And that's something I thought about watching that MASH episode of like, oh, no, this is that content creator that just did the cute video that everybody's seen yes. on social media. And now he's an adult talking about something serious. That's part of our mental health, though, especially our societal mental health and our perception of it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that is exactly right on. There is a recent Vox article on therapists who are content creators and how um, how what they create changes a lot. Um, or mental health, they don't always have to be therapists. And I think you're right, it's a natural progression. But we're seeing it kind of in a different way media but the phenomena existed before then so you're good at, at putting things in that context and that history is it fair to say as a way to kind of wrap this up dr katie gorn joining us um psychiatry psychiatrists whatever the the suffix i'm supposed to use today is psychiatry and the understanding of the human mind it's not a science that's built for immediate um reflection it's not built for real time but the problem is humans are real-time things and need real-time care, especially in the social media age. We're done. Is there a little bit of just a gap of we have this scientific discipline, this medical discipline of how the human mind works and how we need to work on it through therapy and sometimes medication and things, but the urgency of it doesn't match up? Is that a fair, I think criticism is not the right word, but I think that's the gap that you folks as the professionals and us as the patients, because I'm a mental health patient, I think that's the gap that's just built into the system right now. Is that a fair way to look at it? Absolutely. And a lot of us who are therapists have been or are patients too. And so I think we can, I think you're you're right. This has been, as long as I've been in, was in grad school, which was a while ago now, and is a major passion of mine is how do we how do we share what we know from the science in practical ways? I mean, that's what's driven a lot of the work that I've done both creatively and within my role because we cannot just, we can't wait until we have perfect knowledge and share it in the perfect way, especially when other people are out there sharing mental health information and misinformation, right? So I, I think that it's important for us within the mental health field to think about okay, why, what's resonating about this content creator and what can we do to share accurate, helpful information through these media and use some of the same engaging approaches, which is hard. It is admittedly a very difficult thing, but there are people who do it well and that partner with um, content creators to, to share information, which is important. Yeah, my, my dad has a joke where he goes, I'm old enough to remember the $10,000 pyramid and some of my friends know the $100,000 pyramid and then everybody younger than us is like, what's the pyramid? <laughs> so um, so here's the $10,000, $100,000 pyramid question, million dollar question of all this. Are we going to be able to use this social media and the immediacy and news media and the new media environment that's still in its infancy, it's evolving, are we going to be able to use that to bridge that gap in a healthy way? Because that really seems to be the crux of all this, right? We have this gap. We have the old science. We have the new immediacy. How are we going to use this social media and culture stuff to bridge the gap in an effective way? That's really the question, right? It's a good question. I think that we will probably, well, there's, there's competing interests because there are people who want to share information to help others. And then we can't deny that you know, content creators, there are financial and attention uh, incentives. And so all of these things are competing. And I think that's, that's where social media can be a reflection of our larger society, um, that we continue to have different things pulling in different directions. And that makes it challenging to prioritize mental health and accuracy. 
Dr. Katie Gordon. She does a great job on this. She has a book out on uh, suicide prevention that we will recommend and link to. She's got other stuff she's working on. Well, let folks know where they can keep up with you and see you again until we get you back on Herd Tell, which we're going to keep doing. We do it a couple times a year because I think it's really important. If we're going to talk about all this heavy stuff, we got to talk about how we can take care of ourselves while we're swimming upstream, right? We make sure you're floating along a little bit. Uh, Dr. Katie, tell folks how they can keep up with you until we talk to you again. My the Twitter and Instagram is at Dr. Catherine Gordon, D-R-K-T-H-R-Y-N-G-O-R-D-O-N. And those are probably the best ways to keep up with me. I am not doing very interesting content creation <laughs> right now. So that's a warning. But I but perhaps I'll get back into it after this discussion. Yeah, I hope so. You do really good work. We always appreciate your time. We've been doing this for a while with you, all the way back to the old radio days. Yes. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna keep doing it as long as you'll put up with our silly questions because I think it's important. I think it's good to just have a normal conversation about it without you know kind of all the the noise and the heaviness and just because look, I used to be that guy. It took me a little while to talk myself into going right. So you gotta you gotta let folks ease into it a little bit, Doctor Catherine Gordon. Appreciate you. See, I called you Catherine and I did it right that time. I actually rolled my R. Uh, Dr. Catherine Gordon, appreciate your time, ma'am. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure. Yes, ma'am.